Good day student, my name is Sharad Khandaka and today I'll be talking about the mortgage market. This is from chapter number 14 from uh, Miskin and Akins. Uh, the copy of the chapter has been already given to you or should be given to you very soon. Uh, and this is a part of the capital markets unit. Introduction. So the first part of the lecture is introduction. Now in this slide, you can see there is an index that has been included. The index is from 31st May 2016, where it is showing the price of the Australian major cities, which includes Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Hobart, Darwin, Canberra, and the combined capital cities. If you look to the price, the median price of the house in Sydney, according to this report, is $782,000. The Melbourne, the price is $590,000. Now remember, this is the median price. The average price of the Australian house is much higher than this price. Now, that takes us to an important situation, or let's put it this way then, what is the Australian dream? If you're thinking about house price, if you're thinking about the houses, to buy a house is one of the part of Australian dream, then how far are we now? Now, can an individual buy a house with this house price? As we know, in Australia, the average uh, individual income, or we can say the average uh, average monthly wages after the graduation is approximately, uh, annual, uh, annual salary is approximately uh, around $50,000. So how far are we now? Now, let's talk about mortgage. So mortgage is a long-term loan secured by real estate. So when we're talking about mortgage, generally people think the mortgage can, can only be taken by an individual, but actually it's not the case always. So the mortgage can be taken also by the developer. So a developer may obtain a mortgage loan to finance the construction of an office building. An individual family also may obtain a mortgage loan to finance the purchase of their own home. So the mortgage can be taken by either individual or the finance construction company or developer. Now in the mortgage, generally we can see that the payment includes some principal payment and some interest payment. So the mortgage is a combination of the payment which includes principal plus interest. And about 81% of mortgage loan are residential mortgage in the USA, whereas in Australia, it is about 85%. Now, before we going further about the mortgage, we also need to think about the background of mortgage. How these types of loan initially created. Now, if you're, if you're going to the background of mortgage, you need to understand that the mortgage was generally allowed during, uh, so in the US bank uh, was initially allowing the mortgage uh, in the US market. Now, as we know the Australian history is not that old, so we need to go back to the history of mortgage. So we need to go back to either the English history or the American history. So in 1980s, the mortgage bank streamlined their operation, selling the bonds and raised long-term fund, which mainly used to finance or fund the agricultural product. So what does that mean? So during 1980s, the mortgage loan was generally provided to the agricultural farmland. It was not really for the household. So the mortgage loan now, what we can see in the market is not really the traditional way of mortgage. 
So this is a different thing what we're seeing now. However, during the Second World War, or after the Second World, First World War and Second World War, there was a huge uh, decline of the mortgage loan. Or let's put it this way: so the mortgage loan was devastated by the Great Depression in 1930. After the First World War, there was a huge uh, drawback of the mortgage loan. There were so many defaults. And the default was because of, during the time, most of the loan was called the balloon loan. Now, in the mortgage, now what we can see is not the balloon loan. It is basically our, the amortized mortgage. So what are the difference between amortization or amortized mortgage and the balloon loan? The main difference between them is in the amortization, in the monthly payment, the payments also include principal plus interest. Whereas, when you're, whereas when we're talking about the balloon loan, it only includes the interest payment during the time of the loan, and at the end, the borrower has to pay the full amount. That's why it's called the balloon loan. So the characteristics of residential mortgage. Now, as I was discussing that the characteristics of the residential mortgage during the first world war uh, was quite different. And the mortgages, what we can see nowadays, these characteristics are, are mainly developed last 20 to 25 years. And the main changes happen is through the active secondary mortgage or the active secondary market contract. If we also need to mention that the before the large bank was the mainly provider of the mortgage loan. So the large bank you know, used to provide the mortgage only and small provider doesn't have that much of activity or they do not have that much of opportunity to borrow money from the international local market and provide loan. So it was so the small provider was mainly practicing the asset management system. Whereas after whereas last 25 years or 20 years, it, the mortgage market changed a lot. So small provider are becoming very, very competitive and they start providing cheaper mortgage to uh, its customer. Now there is a table which has been included here, the table number 14.1 mortgage loan borrowings 2012. Now this is a bit old data I understand. Uh, this has been taken from the textbook and your textbook is uh, based on the American scenario. It's an American textbook. Unfortunately we couldn't find an Australian textbook for the mortgage market so we are using that one but throughout the slides you will see we talk a lot about the Australian market and the slide also includes lots of information about the Australian housing market and the mortgage market. So in this table what we can see that on the left hand side, this side, is talking about the type of the property. In the middle it is showing mortgage loan issued in million dollars and in the right part of the slide it includes the proportion of total loan. If you look at uh, the family dwellings, you'll find the mortgage loan, the total amount is $9920 million, which is approximately 75.4% of total mortgage. Multifamily dwellings, it is about 6.53%. Commercial is 169 and farmland is about 1.16. So if you add all this value, you will find around 81% of all mortgage loans in the U.S. are residential and the remaining is commercial. And the same way in Australia, around 85% of all mortgage loans are residential mortgage and around 15% is commercial lending. 
So the residential mortgage interest rate, what impacted uh, the mortgage interest rate in the Australian housing market or even in the world market? So there are several factors that impacted the demand and supply of the mortgage. Now, first is the market rates, which depends on large factors, including national and international. Sometimes the bank can independently increase the interest rate even when the RBA is not increasing the interest rate or their cash rate. For example, think about in the year of 2018, in the month of September, several small, several large and small banks increased their interest rate by 0.15%, whereas cash rate remained on hold last two years. And the banks are saying that because of the international factor, their borrowing costs are becoming very high, so they don't have any other option but to increase the interest rate. So it could be the factor which includes national factors or even in the international factor. Second, the longer term mortgage have higher interest rate. Now that makes perfect sense because long term or the longer term horizon has more risk on it. So the long term, the longer the mortgage will be, there is a chance that the higher the interest rate will be. Now discount policy, which is the third point here, uh, the interest payments are made on the beginning of the loan. So the interest discount policy is typically in the US market where they pay a discount price so, and they pay the, the payment at the beginning of the month. But this is not a very common situation in Australia because in Australia the mortgage interest are paying at the end of the month. Fixed versus the variable rate. As we know the loan can be fixed for a number of period. Let's take an example. If Mr. XYZ brought a property and through the mortgage and the duration of the mortgage is say for example 30 years. Typically in Australia the interest rate could be fixed for up to five years for a 30 years loan or mortgage and the fixed period of time the interest rate will not going to change whatever happened to the mortgage market it will remain the fixed on the other hand in the very well rate loan the interest rate will change if there is a change in the market interest rate for example the RBA decided to increase the cash rate that could be a factor to increase the interest rate of variable rate loans and that last point is low dock loan versus standard mortgage the low dock loan is for those people who doesn't have a stable income for example uh, think about the businessman think about a taxi driver his his income might be fluctuated over the time so generally bank can provide them a loan which is called a low dock loan where they don't have any predictable earning uh, so they need to pay a bit higher interest rate and higher deposit on the other hand the, the standard mortgage is that type of mortgage where the people receive the standard documentation and they have a predictable earning and uh, the percentage of deposit need to be paid for the standard mortgage is typically 10 to 20 percent. Now this slide is showing the interest rate in the USA. If you look during 1985, the interest rate in the USA was around 12 percent. Then there was a big drop in the interest rate around 1987 it increased uh, it increased a bit around 1989 and then start declining more steadily
and if you look at the US interest rate which is quite low compared to the Australian market but the factor is here that the interest rate reduced or decreased steadily after 1985. If you look at the figure from this chart we can find the characteristics of residential mortgage in Australian market. You will find around 1993 the interest rate was as high as 20%. Think about it. Currently in Australia the interest rate is around 4%. So I'm talking about uh, October 2018. The interest rate is around 4%. And there are research which suggest that one in every three households are in mortgage stress. But around in, uh, around in 1990s the interest rate was much higher, around 22% which is steadily declined and currently the Australian interest rate it is actually showing the cash rate is around 1.5 percent now remember as our cash rate is 1.5 percent which is historically lowest cash rate in Australian history any cash rate below 3 percent is an emergency rate so uh, Australian cash rate is to its lowest point to any time in Australian history. So characteristics of residential mortgage. Now there are several characteristics of residential mortgage. One, the collateral is the more char common characteristics of the mortgage loan. So what is collateral? It means there are some underlying asset which is including in the mortgage. Now in this case it is the house you are purchasing through the mortgage. So this is the collateral for your own house. Second the down payment is about 10% in Australia. Now around in September 2018 the Royal Commission has started digging down deeper about the conditions of the loan. And the Royal Commission makes very strict for the borrowers to borrow the more money because there are several incident happens as you know so now the down payment is typically around 10 to 20 percent but during the GFC in Australia it was possible to borrow money paying only five percent deposits lenders mortgage insurance is another factor or the another characteristics of a residential mortgage now, anyone is borrowing less more than uh, more than 80 percent of the loan or let's put it another way if anyone is paying less than 20 percent deposit they have to pay a more lenders mortgage insurance in short form it is called LMI now this insurance is for the banks only to protect the bank uh, for any future uncertainty rather than an individual so the individual have to pay LMI and the, the and the price m might vary and could be a significant amount for example anyone is buying a house say it's five hundred thousand dollars house uh, and they're taking a loan of four hundred and fifty thousand dollar the LMI could be as high as around fifteen thousand dollar now borrower qualifications are another important factor so the loan repayment should not be more than 25 percent of the gross salary and all other payment including the mortgage should not be more than 33 percent of the monthly income so bank will see look bank, bank will look all these factors and will check the credit score uh, of the borrower which is another important factor so in this slide we're talking about the mortgage loan amortization so when we're talking about a mortgage loan it's an amortized loan and it the payment includes a part of the principal payment and the part of the interest payment in table 14.3 is showing the amortization of loan for 30 years for $130,000 loan 
at the rate of 8.5% interest rate. If you look into the table, you'll find the first payment for the $130,000 loan is $999.59. The amount will be applied to the interest is $920.83 amount applied to the principal is around $78.75 and the ending balance of the loan is $129,924.24. So only $78 has been reduced for from the principal amount. If you go further, if you look to the number of payment which is 24, you see that the beginning of the loan amount is $128,040. So $128, we keep the same monthly payment because of the fixed interest rate, so which is $999.59. Amount applied to interest is $906, and at the end, the loan balance is $127,947. So over two years period, where the borrower paid more than $24,000 for his loan payment but only cleared about $2,000 from the principal loan amount. So this is a typical example of amortized loan. So the types of mortgage loan what we can see in the market that include insured and conventional mortgage, fixed and variable rate mortgage, graduate payment mortgage, growing equity mortgage, reverse annuity mortgage, and second mortgage or also called the pickback. So we look each of the mortgage for our unit. So the first uh, mortgage are insured, insured and conventional mortgage. So a mortgage that is protected by the mortgage insurance through the Federal Housing Administration, which is predominantly in the US market or the private mortgage insurance that is called the insured mortgage. So in this type of mortgage, if the borrower default on the loan, the insurer must pay the lender the lesser of the loss incurred or the insured amount. So the insured amount will be paid by the insurance company. Now this is typically in the US market. When we're talking about the conventional mortgage, which is nowadays is more common types of mortgage or simply referred as the mortgage loan which is not insured or guaranteed by the federal government. The third types of mortgage what we can see in the market includes fixed rate mortgage or the variable rate mortgage. The fixed rate mortgage is throughout the throughout the period uh, the loan will be paying fixed interest rate. For example if a loan is uh, if a house is mortgaged for 30 years, typically uh, the fixed rate mortgage could be up to 5 years. In some cases, in some bank, it could be up to 10 years. So during this period, the rate will be fixed and the amount that will be paid monthly, which is the monthly premium, will be paid the fixed amount. However, generally, most of the mortgages are the variable rate mortgage, where the the interest rate are typically adjusted in every peer or based on the market movement. Graduated payment mortgage, which is also called G GPMS, which is a very interesting types of mortgage. So this is a fixed types of mortgage in which the payment increase gradually from the initial low base level of the desired uh, low level up to a desired level or the final level. So initially the payment is quite less, but it grows gradually, uh, and the, the and the payment generally generally grows about seven to twelve percent annually from the initial base payment until until it reaches to a full payment of the mortgage. Now this this mortgage is typically uh, start with a low interest rate for the qualified buyer and. The qualified bar are those people who just finished the graduation or just going to the market for the first time and they do not have big amount uh, or, uh, or they cannot afford the big repayment. 
and this is also optimal for the young homeowner as the income level gradually rise to the mid to meet their higher mortgage payment the next option is called the growing equity mortgage now this is by the name we can understand the growing equity mortgage are called gems g j e m s uh, is the payment grow uh, the, the 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 amount of the payment or the uh, the payment uh, grow gradually uh, so that there could be an equity and the equity will be growing and the mortgage will be uh, uh, the mortgage will be paid before the actual date so the payment increase gradually the additional payments amount uh, and the beyond amount actually which is fully amortized payment and goes directly from the principal payment so, so the additional amount directly applied to the principal amount uh, and this way the, the owner of the house can actually save a lot of money uh, from the interest payment and they can repay the mortgage payment uh, quite earlier than the general uh, quite earlier than the general situation the another types of mortgage is also called uh, is called the reverse annuity mortgage now this mortgage is for typically for the older generation older people who reach to a certain level for example who reach the age of in the US it is 62 years in the UK it is around 55 years reach this level and want to get the equity out from their own home this is a very interesting types of mortgage uh, mortgage because instead of the owner or the borrower repay the amount but they can borrow the money or they can they can get some money out from their own home so at the end of the lecture we'll see a video about the reverse annuity mortgage and that will give you a clear idea about the reverse annuity mortgage. Hi, I'm Deborah Nam, and today we're going to answer the question, how does a reverse mortgage work? So here we go. First, the lender has to determine the loan amount. They'll use a formula set out by FHA that takes into account the value of the home, the age of the borrowers, and the current interest rates to determine the loan amount. Usually it's between 40 and 60 percent of the home value depending on your age. Once they know what you qualify for, then they'll want to know how you want to take your money. The closing costs of the loan will be rolled into the loan itself. This means you'll have a starting balance equal to those costs plus any other funds you decide to take at closing. Perhaps you have your home paid off and don't need to have all of the loan money right now. You could choose to take your loan proceeds in the form of tenure, which is a monthly payment for as long as you live in the home. In this scenario, on the first of every month, you will receive tax-free funds from the lender. Each month, you would also receive a mortgage statement. It'll show you the prior month's loan balance, the amount of payment to you, the amount of interest and insurance charged, and the new loan balance. Or perhaps you'd like to have all of your loan funds ready and available as you need them in a line of credit. In this scenario, you would receive a statement each month from the lender showing the existing loan balance and the amount of funds previously available in a line of credit. The statement would also show any withdrawals you made from the line of credit the prior month and the new available line of credit. One of the coolest features of this particular scenario is that the line of credit on a reverse mortgage grows over time. The amount available to you in the line of credit grows at a rate equal to the rate charged on the loan itself plus one and a quarter percent. So reverse mortgage line of credit in the amount of $100,000 today would be over $104,000 next year. It's a great incentive to limit your withdrawals, building up that line of credit over time so that when you're 70, 80, or 90, and really need money for home health care or other emergencies, you have more to draw from. Another scenario would be to take all your money right now to make a major purchase like a second residence or investment property. The last and most popular scenario is to combine those different payout options, perhaps taking some funds at closing to pay off other debts and leaving the rest in a line of credit. It's your choice. I've had clients who choose some cash, some line of credit, and a 10-year payment as well. It's up to you. If you currently have a traditional or forward mortgage, you can use the reverse mortgage to pay it off. In fact, it's required by the lenders that any existing mortgage on the property must be paid off with the reverse loan proceeds. 
The reverse has to be the only loan on the property. Now you know the bank's gonna make money on this reverse mortgage, right? They're a bank and that's what they do. I mean really, they're in those big tall buildings downtown and they're happy to make money off of us millions living in our sweet little homes. Basically, the banks and investors are just patient. They wait. They wait until you die, sell, or permanently leave the home due to medical reasons. Then all the funds that have been borrowed, plus all the accrued interest and insurance is due and payable. Usually, the heirs will sell the home, pay off the reverse, and keep the change. But if the home does not have enough value to pay off the balance, then what? This part's pretty cool. The reverse mortgage is a non-recourse loan. This means if the proceeds from the sale of the home are not sufficient to pay off the mortgage, the bank has no recourse to the borrower or their heirs for the shortfall. So the worst that can happen is your kids get nothing from the home when you pass away. Second mortgage or piggyback. This is quite an interesting mortgage and this is, the more, uh, this is an interesting type of loan. Now, this type of loan is for the people who generally do not have a big deposit when they'll be taking a loan. For example, in Australia, uh, if anyone, anyone want to buy a house and want to borrow money from the bank, they need about 10 to 20 percent deposits. However, anyone want to borrow more than 80 percent, they need to take a lender's, lender's mortgage insurance, in short, which is also called LMI. However, through the piggyback, they can avoid the lender's mortgage insurance. Now, how it can happen? For example, let's take it. Let's take this example. A borrower with a down payment less than twenty percent of the home price will need to pay for mortgage insurance, or which is also called LMI. When using a piggyback mortgage, lender structure the loan differently. For example, the same borrower might be might pay for the home with a 10% down payment and 80% main loan and 10% piggyback or the second mortgage loan. So in this scenario, what will happen? The main loan would be 80%. The borrower have 10% deposit already. So they take another small loan from same institution or could from another one so they take another small loan uh, which is up to 10 percent so they take 10 percent loan and they have 10 percent deposit so they combine it together so 10 percent plus 10 percent is 20 percent and they take the loan so their main mortgage is still 80 percent so they're avoiding the lender's mortgage insurance but take they're taking a second loan and typically the interest rate of the piggyback loan is higher than the general loan. Loan servings. Now, when we're talking about the loan serving, there are a few things we need to understand. That many financial institutions, they do not want to hold a large portfolio of the long-term loan. So when you're talking about Australian market, all the large banks, they do not want to keep the, a very big portfolio of the loan amount so they might want to sell a part of this loan to the international market for example commercial bank mainly collected their fund from the short-term sources and also through doing a large amount of off balance sheet businesses and fee-based income now the loan originators fees are typically one percent of the loan amount through this varies uh, with the market and they can sell some of this loan amount to the international market. Now, how they do it? They do it through the securitization process. Now, the next couple of lecture slide is discussing about the securitization of the mortgage. Now, lecture slide number 20, 21, and 22 talk about the securitization. Now, instead of discussing all the slides, I will be talking about slide number 22 which will give you a clear idea about the securitization process. Now here, you can see this is a homeowner. So this is an individual homeowner. So the individual homeowner will be going to the bank to borrow some money. For example, he's going to small bank. It's a small lender. So they go to this lender 
for a loan and they get the funding but the home is is uh, having so the go, the home is having a mortgage to this bank now bank a for example in this case we are thinking that they sell a bulk of this loan to a third party or intermediary or it could be an uh, an investment bank for example Macquarie bank sell the loan product so the Macquarie bank what did it does or the third party what it does is it create an individual entity it's called the mortgage back vehicle uh, or special purpose vehicle they create an independent entity based on uh, the underlying security which is the houses and this special purpose vehicle this the raise funds from the international market issuing the bonds so in here MBS mortgage back security this is the uh, a trustee that issuing bond in the market so the bond could, could be ranked in different ranking for example some home loan having higher risk and some home loan having a lower risk so the so the based on the riskiness this loan divided and they sell it to the market according to the ranking so if the loan is having a having a uh, high risk involvement so that then it will be highly risky uh, bond in the market and it will attract higher yield on the other hand if it's more secure then uh, the bond will be selling in the market will have lower yield so the investors will buy the bond in the international market so we can talk about the international market here we are talking about the local market so the homeowners uh, goes to the bank uh, the bank is the local bank and they get the funding the bank sell a bulk of this asset to third party or an uh, or a uh, or an uh, investment bank uh, so they buy the large part of the portfolio to the investment bank and then they create a special purpose vehicle in the market uh, still this to the special purpose vehicle they sell bond in the market different types of bond based on the ranking and the investors buy it so the investors they get send them the funding this funding goes from MPS to the third party and this funding also goes to the bank and the bank pay to the homeowner so this is the process of the sectorization why they do bank to the sectorization process because it is actually reducing their risk it is spreading the risk across so if anything happen on not on the one financial institution will be affected but it is spread across different institutions so that individual riskiness uh, of this project reduced so collateral debt obligation is talking about the same thing so it's, it's it's a structured financial product the tool to get the cash flows generating asset which could be the houses and repackage their asset pool into a uh, discrete transit that can be sold to an investor so the discrete transit sold to an investor so the collateralized debt obligation is also called because the pool assets such as the mortgages bonds loans are essentially debt obligations that serve as collateral for the CDO however so we talk about the real estate we talk about the mortgage market last couple of lectures so last couple of slides now we talk about the real estate bubble now is real estate bubble is is existing to the Australian market the mortgage market are heavily influenced by the real estate boom and burst between 2000 till 2008 in the USA and if you look at to how the market inflated during the time we'll find that during this time about every year the house price was increasing at the rate of eight to nine percent and in 2005 it increased by 17 percent alone so we can see that the house price how it was increasing and after the global financial crisis in the USA in several part of the USA house price declined sharply and declined by 50 percent 
so here it is actually showing how the real estate bubble happened in the USA first the increase of the subprime loan with many people qualifying for the loan that increased loan demand this means within a short period of time many people was qualified for purchase of a house while construction increased it couldn't cope up with the demand and the second part the real estate speculators were the second driver of the house price bubble and it was suddenly seen that it's an easy money by selling the houses but this profitability this increased profitability couldn't stay longer so it happens in the USA so in this chart you can see the market of two different countries one is the USA which is the blue line second is Australia which is the red line if you look at the blue line you can see the how the house price in the USA was increasing since 1980s so you can see the price was not increasing heavily but if you look at to during 2000 to 2010 this house was increased suddenly at very high level and during 2007 house price has a crash and declined however look at Australia the Aussies are wearing even a bigger bubbles so Australian house was still increasing still increasing now this is 2018 some part of the Sydney and Melbourne start declining so are we in the housing are we in the housing bubble in Australia so this is question to you what do you think so this is absolutely important to understand what is the housing bubble or the real estate bubble so let's look at a couple of slides that will give you some more idea about the housing bubble in this slide is talking about the most expensive real estate in the world if you look this slide you'll find the most expensive real estate in the world is number one Hong Kong second Sydney and Melbourne is not far behind so in Australia we're having one of the highest house price in the world this slide it was, it, this slide is uh, about the most expensive real estate if you look the right hand side you'll find the Belgium Canada and Australia is having the most expensive houses in the world on the other hand Japan Korea Germany Estonia they have moderately lower house price the next slide is talking about the Oswego mortgages to hit so the Oswego mortgage rate compared to the total loan so it's residential real estate loan to the total loan if you look at it here the residential mortgage loan of Australia is about 64 percent of out of total loan of Australian bank in the USA the loan was only 35 percent even in the USA having just 35 percent loan or 35 percent real estate loan compared to the total loan of the portfolio US couldn't survive properly the GFC has a strong heat in the US market but if you look to Australia which is currently having around 65 percent of the real estate loan compared to the total loan now think about it if anything happened in Australia like the US said then the house price declined significantly which we can see now in 2018 that the house price in Sydney and Melbourne are declining what will happen can Australia take this blow this question is to you thank you very much for listening to my lectures hopefully you enjoy the lecture and uh, please try to read this question and try to answer by yourself thank you very much for listening it and I wish you a wonderful day thanks